Delighted to say I'm joined by 1987 and 88 All-Ireland winner Liam Hayes, who of course owns the uh, Hero Books, putting out a lot of really good GA books at the moment. I did an interview with Richie Bennis recently, Kevin Max Day also, they came out through Hero Books, so you can check out those interviews on the uh, on the playlist there on ourgame.ie. So first of all, uh, Liam, how are you doing? Are you, everything well at the moment? Everything is great, Shane. No, no major dramas, uh, apart from the the massive drama that's uh, that's loose in all our lives at the moment, but everything else is good with me personally. Um, like everybody else, I was getting busy. I thought I was getting really busy up to last month. We have a big publishing program in Hero Books. We really scaled the company here and in England, and uh, we're still planning to do publish about 30 books this year. So it's going to be a, hopefully a very busy second half of the year. Does it change how you operate? Because I suppose most people are doing their books either at home or, I mean, whoever you have writing the books, like Dennis Hurley is doing Larry Tompkins, which uh, Kieran Kennedy did, Richie Bennis. I mean, that book is obviously out. But whoever the author is and the subject matter, so they can speak or the phone records. You know, is it, is it business as usual in a sense? It, it pretty much is. Like we have, uh, you know, we have a number of 23 books that were going to be between GA, soccer, uh, racing other sports that we're going to be publishing in Ireland this year. We've got uh, eight, ten books in England. So in each case, they're all being ghostwritten by a professional writer, and those writers are working away. Some of them have completed all of the interview process uh, and are now building manuscripts for us, and some are just delayed in that interview process. But again, they you know they they uh, they can start writing. So that's the great thing about working with journalists even at this time when they're when they're based at home or even if they're isolating it gives them a lot of time to knuckle down and just start writing so given that you you own the company how much of a hands-on sort of a, an impact do you have on these do you like to be involved uh, or do you just step back no i love it and it, and one of we've done a number of of themes in our publishing program this year shane and one of them is our legend series so Richie Bennis was the first of those, and we have nine more uh, books and memoirs from GAA Legends coming out this year. But that was a remarkable, um, uh, it, was a, it was a remarkable uh, piece of business for me because it was more than business. I mean, I went and, you know, personally sat down with Richie, with Len Gaynor, you know, with Dennis Coughlin, with Donny O'Sullivan, you know, uh, with Martin Oak Morrissey in Waterford. Martin was centre back on the Waterford team that won the All-Ireland in 59. So these people, um, you know, Johnny Callanan and Claire and uh, Mick Jacob and Wexford, and they were, most of them were men I had never met before, but they welcomed me into their homes. I sat down, explained myself. Sometimes I met them two or three times. Uh, most of them had no real initial interest in, in having their memoir published, but all of them realized pretty quickly how important it is to really to reflect on life especially with this coronavirus, but at any time, it's good to reflect on life. And also it's good to allow the people in your lives to reflect on your life, to bring them into your life, because so many of us don't talk about our lives, especially older people. I don't know if you find that with, with parents. They don't often sit down for hours and end and tell you about their lives and their early lives. So these books are amazing. The men I met were amazing. Their stories aren't just the stories of men on football and hurling fields, they're the stories of men uh, in real life, their social and cultural histories. Uh, like I spent a long afternoon with Paddy Doherty up in Castle Wellen and down. He was known to be the most skillful, the most dangerous forward of his time. And some people will tell you he still ranks as probably the most, probably the most feared forward in the country. But when you meet him now and you sit down, in his house himself and his wife Angela and they talk about their lives you just feel honored to be there because they're sharing something really special with you they're trusting you as a publisher to to bring their story to you know, a large number of people and for me it was it was probably the most rewarding 12 months of my publishing career to meet all these men in the last 12 months and to be trusted by them it, it, it's it's uh, we've got some remarkable stories and I think people are going to love them when how much of what you're doing now is informed by your own experience of writing your own autobiography back in, I'm not sure exactly the year, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me, but Out of Their Skins, your revered book, very much an insight into what's happening in the dressing room, very, um, 
I mean, very, very revealing in terms of your own personal life, the ups and downs that everyone goes through. Now, I'll, I'll also want to jump back even further. Like you started out as a journalist, age 17, with the Mead Chronicle. Were a journalist throughout your, your Mead footballing career, which I'm sure caused a couple of uh, eyebrows to be raised at times. But how much of what you're doing now is informed by writing your own autobiography? Uh, it's it's I, I was in a privileged position, Shane, in that, as you said, I was... In the old days, I joined my local newspaper, the Mead Chronicle, straight from school. There were very few college courses available. And if you could get into your local newspaper, then that's what you did. So I served an apprenticeship uh, under Tom Mooney in the Mead Chronicle for five years. And during that time, I was, I was on the Mead minor team and I was breaking onto the senior team. Uh, so I wanted to be a journalist. I also wanted to be a county footballer. The two were not really compatible. Uh, I think in my in my autobiography back then, which was published in 92, the year I, I published it in my last year on the Mead team. Um, but in that, in that book, I, I talk about one early game where uh, I was breaking through to the team. We were playing against Tyrone in the National League up in Pomeroy. And for some reason, the Mead Chronicle told me I'd also be reporting on the game. I was a sub. Uh, I was sitting beside Noel Coogan, a rival newspaper journalist in the dugout. Uh, me with my tracksuit on. I had a pen and paper in my in my pocket. And when I went out at half time for the kickabout, I didn't give my pen and paper to Noel. I actually ran around uh, at the half time kickabout and I lost my pen. And I was running around the pump trying to find my pen. And it was this sort of stuff was going on. And they were the early days which were which were sort of interesting and humorous. Uh, but it got pretty serious then when me made the breakthrough and I had to write every Sunday on whoever we were playing that, that day. And that was tough. Some lads were very good. I sat down, for instance, with Jack Sheedy in the middle of our games against Dublin. I sat down with Dermot McNichol before an All-Ireland semi-final in 87. Dermot McNichol was the, the Derry forward. But it also tells you something about, when I talk about the Legends series and what we're doing now, uh, that brings you back into a, a, an era a long, long time ago. But even us in the 80s and 90s, in those days, Shane, I didn't need to ask anyone's permission. I didn't tell Sean Boylan that I was going to interview Dermot McNichol, and Dermot McNichol didn't ask, have to ask anyone's permission in Derry. So a Wednesday before an All-Ireland semi-final, the two of us are sitting down, chatting with a, uh, at a bench outside a restaurant, and we're chatting for two hours. No restrictions. Um, a whole different era, a whole different time. Uh, Probably more honest time, I think, as well. And that, that sort of reflected in my book. Because I was a journalist, uh, I had to be fairly honest in Out of Our Skins. And it was a bit raw. If I look back now, I'd probably feel I'd do a better job writing it. So it was fairly raw. It was from the dressing room. Um, I think only two Mead footballers really found fault with it. And, and sort of I fell out with them for a small period of time because of maybe things I said about them. Um, but by and large, opponents didn't uh, take it too personally, and I didn't get any extra. Uh, I didn't get any extra punishment from opponents. I, I feel. Though on one occasion, Michael Lester said to me before an All Ireland semi final in 1990, uh, I was Michael Lester was talking to me, and he said to me, "I was up at Donegal, and they're doing a lot of talking about you and things you've written about them." And I said, "Why? What have I written about them?" He said, "No, there's a few lads. They're looking to. Uh, they're looking to get some big hits on you. They're going to. They're going to take you out." And uh, that was the only time that it came home to me that lads were really reading very closely what I was writing about them. Because I, actually, a couple of years ago, uh, being involved with Kula, we were in a Leinster club final against O'Loughlin Gales. And I was asked, would I go and do interview one of the O'Loughlin Gales players, Martin Comfort, mm -hmm. who's now a selector under Brian Cody. And I kind of, I was trying to make a push, uh, you know, obviously to try and do something different. But at the 11th hour, I decided to pull out because I just thought that given the, the scrutiny, given how people twist things, the fact that it could come across as almost being a bit sneery or not taking it seriously, I just kind of yeah. opted, opted out of doing it. Um, but back in, like, can you see how media has changed so much that doing it now, it wouldn't be taken the same way as doing it 30 years ago? It would be impossible to do it now. And that's why I'm saying I was lucky in many respects because it was a different time. The game is now so controlled um, that it just wouldn't be possible. Um, which is a shame in many ways, but that's you know that's the way things have evolved. It's funny when you talk about that, you pulling out of of, of that assignment. The only time I pulled back on, on, and we were talking earlier about when I was writing a column for the Sunday Tribune and you were editing in the Sunday Tribune, 
um, when I was managing Carlo for two years, uh, 04, 05, I think it was, we were playing Wicklow in the first round of the championship. And I was due to write a piece for PJ Cunningham about the match. Now it was 31 against, 31st against the 32nd place teams in the country. Uh, nobody else was going to read it, probably only Carlo people and, 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 uh, and Wicklow people. Um, but I remember I was writing it and I had it written and I phoned PJ and said, no, I, I don't want to write this. I don't want to see this in print. Uh, I think it was because I'm the manager of the team and, and Carlo Wicklow was always a big duel, a big derby. And I felt I could cause offence or could cause trouble for my own players. And PJ, decent man as he is, said that's OK. And he allowed me to sidestep my column that one week. Did you find like when you did your actually I'll reference the the, the Sunday Tribune as well when you got mm. uh, were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma I remember an article I remember that the headline was there was obviously a photo of you and then the big C was the was the um, the headline on the article obviously re- referencing cancer and then obviously you were quite you know explicit in terms of describing what happened in your personal life in your book did you was it do you do you find it hard to actually divulge that information or is that something that you kind of feel or it comes easier to you for whatever reason yeah i'm sort of open and, and maybe a little bit too open at times um like what i was going to say to you earlier was that because i was in the lucky privileged position of playing and writing uh, i always felt i set the bar fairly high for myself in terms of uh, I am very self-critical, and as a footballer, I was extremely self-critical. Uh, and and it's a bit like a teacher in the classroom if he's teaching one of his own kids. You know, he sets the bar very high with his own child. So I set the bar very high for myself. I thought, um, and therefore, when I was writing about any other players or teams, uh, I always had the bar very high. Um, I know, like for three or four years there, I was writing about Kerry and Kerry people. I was getting a lot of feedback. A lot of Kerry people were offended. Um, they were taking it personally, and. And any time I spoke to people or met people or explained myself, I would say, listen, you know, you're the greatest team in the history of the game. You're like the Muhammad Ali of Gaelic football. Uh, everyone knows you're number one. Everyone knows why you're great. But because you're that good, you deserve greater analysis. And with greater analysis will come some criticism. If you're the greatest and you, you have to live up to that legacy and you're not living up to it at times, then the criticism will be heavy handed. So I always... I was I always tried to be as honest as that and therefore, you know, uh, you know, may have offended people at different stages, but it was never meant to be personal. It was always meant to be uh, constructive. It was always meant to be, you know, straight up. And ju- just to talk about um, moving on to going from sports to actually writing fiction. So you wrote mm-hmm. a book called uh, or a novel called You Haven't Got It All. The t- you Haven't Got All the Time in the World, Heidi Wells. How do you mm-hmm. move from a situation where you're I mean, my experience is you, you're doing sport and obviously you have the life plan for me and all that kind of stuff to write in fiction. Uh, I think like any writer, you always wanted to, to, to test yourself in a sequel, you write a novel. Uh, and, and it certainly was always an ambition of mine. Now, Heidi Wells is a book that I have self-published on Amazon. It's there for people to buy, but it's really only published for family and friends um, or anybody else who wants to buy it. But it's it's um, it's it's a book that I'm still working on and aim to get published in, in America. I really was trying to trying to target the American market. Uh, I'm writing my second uh, novel at the moment. Again, it's, uh, my female is my is my um, is my hero in the book. It's a 16 year old girl called Avery Truffle. And the reason I say that is that um, when you start off with a hero and you create a character and then you build characters around them. It's a bit like being master of the universe as a writer. Uh, you are building uh, everything. You're building the whole set, the life, experiences. I found it really liberating as a writer. I felt you could do anything you wanted to do. And also I found, which many people always talk about when they have written a novel, is that I started with a cast of characters whom I really liked, uh, two or three of them I loved. Uh, but they changed during the course of the novel. And, and, and a novel, a storyline can dictate to you you know, a certain course it's going to take. And I found that a real learning experience uh, and a really enjoyable experience. So I'm not doing any more writing now. Um, I have just finished my final book, which is a, uh, it's a biography of a family. It's, it's a small little book, which I've done for a family, uh, which um, 
it will be published in the next uh, few months. It's a it's a personal book I wanted to write for them. But no, I'm just publishing now and editing. And uh, the only writing I'm doing are my, is my own uh, is my own fiction. But that's just pure joy to sit down and build characters. And uh, like in Heidi Wells, you know, someone is murdered at the end of the book. And again, I had no intention of the of reaching that ending. I didn't think that would happen, uh, but it occurred quite naturally. So um, uh, it's it's just it's it's freedom as a writer. It's great to do that. It's just sit down and and create this cast of characters. Because I would you know, sorry the last thing, Shane. When you're writing like that, sorry I'm interrupting you. You have to have a sense of what you're capable of. I mean, I don't believe. Yeah, and I'm very self-critical. Uh, I don't believe I can win a Booker Prize today or tomorrow. Neither do I want to. I would like to write fiction. I would like to become hugely successful and sell hundreds of thousands of copies. So I picked a genre which is uh, Stephen King, Neck of the Woods. So my storylines are a bit like you know what you would expect to see in a Stephen King novel. Maybe not quite up to his speed or to you know his greatness, but that's where I decided. Yeah, I think I could be capable of writing a book of that nature. I think as a writer, that's what you got to do. You got to say, what are you capable of doing, and then decide to do it. Um, if I decided to write a, a real literary work in the morning, I don't know. Think I'd enjoy it as much, and I mightn't be able to do it. So, I, I aim to, I, I aim to hit a certain genre, a certain market. You, you often hear the the saying that there's a everyone has a book in them. Um, mm. You also quite regularly hear of people writing stuff that's almost semi-autobiographical that they basically base something around their own lives because they know that so well and it's very easy to draw on those things whereas you've gone the other direction and you said a 16 year old girl and then there's Heidi Wells also so you've yeah. kind of gone the other direction what made you do that uh well Heidi was an interesting one sorry I won't go into bore you too much detail of the storyline but when I got cancer the first time um it dawned on me that you never, you know, suddenly you were looking down a road, you didn't know how much time you had. You know, the first time I had stage one wasn't too bad, but, you know, at the same time you think you may not survive. The second time I got cancer in 2015, it was stage three, it was more difficult. But in, the first time I was looking down the road and I said, okay, I don't know how many years I've left, if I have years left. And it suddenly said to me, wouldn't it be great if you knew if somebody told you, maybe it wouldn't be great, but wouldn't it be helpful maybe? Someone told you, when you're going to die, the day, the year, the month, and how you're going to die. And if someone told you that, what would you do? How would it change your life? So in Heidi Wells's case, what happens is her father sits her down and he tells her she's going to die on this day, this month, and she's going to drown. And he tells her he knows the death days of all his children. Uh, and Heidi is left with this information and it's up to her to decide whether to share it with her siblings or to meet her fate. Uh, and that's the storyline. But it came about through my own self-inspection, my own self-analysis of my own life and saying, if I knew I had two years left or six years left or seven years left, how would I change my life? What would I do? So it is it is personal, you know what I mean? And you bring that personal experience, that, that your own thinking onto the page with you. Because it does sound like the sentiment there is fairly grim. So mm. is, is that sort of that's the mindset of someone who's in that position that you're in a dark place. Yeah. And, but how you deal with that, how you cope with that, you know, I mean, Heidi deals with it uh, quite well for long periods and she goes into dark places for a while. Um, and, um, but it really, the thought was how beneficial would that be? And I'm not being, I'm not trying to be, um, make light of people who get a terminal illness, and are told they have three months or six months left. My illness wasn't like that. I was one of the lucky ones. I was told I had a fighting chance. You know, I was told at X percentage chance of getting well again. Um, if I was told, had been told, you've got three months or six months to live, I'm sure I wouldn't have had that thought process and I wouldn't have even thought of writing and creating Heidi Wells. Um, so, I mean, again, I was lucky in terms of, I, I have no idea what people who, you know, the people who get a terminal illness uh, and, and really get a timeline that's very short, uh, I've no idea how they think or how they react to that. I know they're very courageous. Anybody I've known who's been in that position, but I haven't been in that position myself. So I'm, I would stress that Heidi is not trying to make light of somebody who gets a terminal diagnosis, you know. 
If we can move on to your, your football career, and I'm sorry, you're getting very grim and, and dark there, aren't you? Well, I mean, that's just uh, that's just the way it is. I mean, there's no point in dancing around it. But if we're to jump into your your football career, I mean, you'll always be tied. But a, a Mead team that knew how to look after itself, we'll put it that sort of way. When you look back in that career and the great times you had and winning the All Irelands and getting an All Star. Do you consider yourself, like Bernard Flynn put it to me, so your former teammate for people who aren't familiar with the team, corner forward at the time, he sort of said you were one of the most underrated players at the time. And the conversation I was having with him is, you know, I would have remembered maybe some of the other players like Bernard or, or Brian Stafford or Joe Castles that when I thought, or Colin O'Rourke even, I wouldn't have necessarily thought of, you know, I was a young lad, you know, mm. seven or eight watching you, that you're, you wouldn't have kind of been the first name to spring to mind at all. And he said that that's because you were one of the more underappreciated players at the time. Um, do you think that's fair? He's been decent to me. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I think it is. As I say, I was always been, I would always be self, self-critical. I mean, I thought, um, being perfectly honest with you, I was... Um, uh, in terms of, I was given amazing talents uh, and had an had an amazing ability. My biggest trouble as a, as a footballer was a little bit maybe of uh, OCD in terms of analysing, overanalyzing myself and overanalyzing the game. And I would find it very hard sometimes to concentrate solely and singly on the game at hand. And um, and when I look back on my career, I was lucky. You know, I won all Ireland. I was part of a great team with a great bunch of lads. I won man of the match. In, in one All Ireland, I had my highs, my lows. Uh, but when I look back at my career again, I would say I probably hit ten out of ten, maybe you know, two every two out of every ten games, and I think I was probably seven out of ten, eight out of ten, you know, seven or eight games. Um, so you know, it was my own fault, you know, that I didn't maybe uh, do more or, or live up to my own abilities. And and it's funny when I look back on my career now, I played with. Mead for 20 years under 14 minor, 21 and 12 years in the senior team, six years of which we won everything. But the real shame is that when you look back, you only look back at the games you failed in. Uh, and lots of other footballers and hurlers and rugby players I speak to all the time have the same experience. Uh, the victories just are, are literally, they're just boxed up and put away. And when you, the games that come thundering back into your brain at all sorts of crazy times are are the defeats and the games in which you failed yourself. Uh, so I, I always think, I'm forever thinking about the two All-Ireland finals we lost. I played in six county finals with Screen, my club, uh, with Colin O'Rourke and myself, and uh, we lost all six. So they're the games you remember. We never won any while I was playing with Screen. So you're left with those memories. Um, but getting back to Bernard, I mean, I was... I was part of an amazing me team. I talk about it because uh, I do some public talks and I, when I'm hosting our book launches to a few hundred people. I talk with the me team and, and we were an amazing team in that we had, uh, first of all, we had two and a half geniuses in our full forward line. And most teams might have one. If you don't have two geniuses, you probably won't win in all Ireland. You have to have geniuses in your full forward line. Uh, uh, I don't hide the fact that Bernie was the half a genius. Uh, he's been in he's been in 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 my company when I've made this speech, and I've said that we had two and a half geniuses. O'Rourke and Stafford were fully fledged geniuses, and Bernard was a half a genius. But being better, being a half a genius is better than being no genius at all. And um, we had those guys. We also had in our team. I always talk about two psychopaths. Most teams are lucky to have one. We had two. Uh, they were dynamic presence in our team. And then we had four old men. They were the old boys club in our team. They were the they were the leaders in our team. In terms of Nick Lyons, uh, Colin O'Rourke, Jerry McEntee, Joe Castles, so I was I was on a team that was populated by big characters and some outstanding players. So there was a lot of us who were the, you know, who were the, uh, uh, who were there to fill in fill in the boxes. Um, not exactly domestics. We all had our had our day in the sun as well. But we were we were on a team that was filled with some amazing characters. Yeah, I mean, I can't but latch on to saying two psychopaths in the team. Is, is there self analysis in that, or is is are you no, talking about other? No, I, I, it's 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 funny because it's not Mick Lyons and it's not Liam Harn and it's not the usual suspects. Um, I won't name them here for 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 lots of reasons. Uh, but I do remember a meet game. We were talking about what our our mentality on the meet team early on was. We had spent twenty years 
fading to Dublin. And then we had spent three or four years ourselves losing to Dublin in big games. So when we beat Dublin in the 1986 Leinster final for the first time in 20 years, we said they're never getting back up. We have our foot on their, on their neck and they're never getting back up. So for the next six years, we basically beat Dublin. But we would talk about Dublin all the time. We, if, every time Dublin changed our manager, we would talk in team talks about him. Every time Dublin brought on a new footballer, we would talk about him in team talks for hours. Vinnie Murphy, Declan Bulger, we talked about them for hours. We, we, we promised ourselves their careers should be snuffed out at the very beginning. They could never, ever, ever become uh, strong. They could never be allowed uh, to breed on the Dublin team. And we were in one late league final where we made a promise that if X or Y on the Dublin team uh, got near the ball, that something should happen. And I remember a scuffle starting and I looked around and there was four Dublin players on the ground and there was only three meat players standing over them. But the row had happened and it had ended, Shane, before I even knew it had started. So again, I wasn't one of the uh, I wasn't one of the good fighters in the meat team. I didn't I don't even get the plaudits when when they categorise who were the real warriors. But uh, I was surrounded by warriors and luckily so. When you when you think back of that era and your role in the dressing room, were you a quiet sort? Were you pally with all the players? Were you distance? How how would you characterise it? I was always fairly. I, I was you know. Uh, you know, I was sort of in between. Sean Bowling came in and he had a lot of he had a lot of older guys that who were looking to really have their last chance. And that's like some of the lads I mentioned, Colin and Jerry and Joe Castles and Mick Lyons. Uh, he found a lot of young lads who came on the team. And then there was a group of us in between, lads like myself, Finian Murta, Colin Coyle, uh, who had been around a while, a few years. So uh, I was sort of in the middle. Um, very pally with Bob O'Malley, very pally with Mickey McQuillan. Uh, I didn't drink during my career. I never drank alcohol. I was from a, a, a family of, of, of uh, pioneers. My dad was, uh, you know, one of the one of the top people in the uh, Pioneer Association in the country, Jim Hayes. So um, uh, I didn't drink till I was in my thirties. So win all Ireland's, lose all Ireland's. You know, I wasn't I wasn't taking a drink after any game, um, and therefore I wasn't in the you know I wasn't in the thick of all the, the big social gatherings. Uh, you know, I wasn't one of those guys on the team. I was, I was pretty much doing my own thing. Um, the, the difference for me was in 1991 when Sean Boyle made me team captain because, you know, we didn't know that, um, you know, there were going to be four games against Dublin in the first round of the championship and 10 games in total before we got to the All-Ireland final. So when you think about it, uh, I was making a team speech before the game, at halftime, after the game, before extra time, in the middle of extra time, like I was making like five or six team speeches in each of those four games against Dublin. And so suddenly I went from being one of the, maybe quite one of the quieter lads in the dressing room to lads were hearing me all the time. And, um, yeah, so that was a, that was a, that was a different, that was a sort of a changing point in, um, in my career when I was captain in 91. Because not only were you having your, your speaks during, during the match, also, a couple of those games, if, if uh, like Bernard was saying to me, a couple of those games fell on Saturdays and you would have a piece in the Sunday press on the, the very next day on the Sunday. I mean, there, there had to be a few players whose eyebrows were raised at a minimum over that. Yeah, I mean, after the last game against Dublin, I had to go to, um, when the game was over, I had to go back to Burkey to the Sunday press, the old Sunday press, which was the sister paper of the Irish press. I had to go back there and write my uh, report because uh, they'd kept the top of the front page of the newspaper for me. So I went straight from the dressing room in Crow Park into the newsroom in the press, I wrote my piece. Uh, I was sweating profusely and I had a couple of uh, cuts on me. And I wrote my piece and then I had to hightail it to the mansion house because the Lord Mayor of Dublin had a reception for the both teams. And so I went from the newsroom straight to the mansion house up on stage because I had to make a speech. Uh, on behalf of the Mead team, followed by Tom Carr making a speech on behalf of the Dublin team. So, you know, fairly mad, uh, you know, madcap sort of of mix of, of roles, you know. Um, but it was interesting, you know, to, 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 to wear both caps is something, as I say, that most people wouldn't get a chance now until they retire. 
you know, GA players, rugby players don't get a chance to really articulate or talk about themselves at the games until they retire. Uh, I guess I was lucky that I had the chance to do it, you know, right through my whole career. I, I was told that you kind of only once, uh, I'm not sure, was it you lost the head with Sean Boylan or the other way around, but a whistle went uh, flying. Do you recall that story? Uh, God, myself and Sean were very, very close to one another, you see, and sometimes we were too close and sometimes uh, when there was, Sean and myself had always had, fairly dramatic falling outs. Um, we'd always kiss and make up very quickly. I mean, he's a man who changed my life like so many people. He's a man who I'd be indebted to for the rest of my life. But yeah, there was one occasion when um, I would lose the rag with Sean pretty quickly, fairly easily. We were in that Dalton Park one one evening training. It was some big match coming up and, and the pressure was on everyone. Everyone was stressed out. It was absolutely lashing rain. And Sean started doing this drill. And... I got talking to somebody and or somebody asked me a question and I replied and I turned around and I asked Sean, what did you say? And he got thick with me and uh, I got thick with him and he came over to me and threw the whistle at my feet and said, OK, you take the fucking session. And Sean never cursed and he turned on his feet and walked off the training field and left me there with the 30 other players looking an idiot. Lash and rain with the whistle at my feet. So I had to run in after Sean and say, listen, they'll come back, come back, come back. Um, Colin O'Rourke always said that if I wasn't as thick and as stupid as I am, I would have taken up the whistle and let Sean keep on walking. Um, but that was Colin being as encouraging and his, being his, his, uh, his good friend uh, to me. Um, but uh, yeah, Sean and myself had some, uh, had some uh, interesting falling outs at times. At the end of my career too, it was funny. Um, see, my career ended quickly. I fell out of the game at about 28, fell out of love with the game. I wanted to retire. I decided I was going to retire by 30. I, had, I was married. I had um, two young children. Um, and um, I decided I, I needed to retire. I decided I needed to, to move on with my life. And Sean and myself had a couple of interactions then. It was, it was one occasion when in the dressing room, he had two games coming up. He said, OK, who's available to go to Gorey? on Thursday and who's available to go to Bantry for the weekend for a Sunday game. Uh, I was the only one. He went around the whole dressing room, one man by man. I was the only one who said, I'll be in Gory, but I won't be in Bantry. And um, I didn't know what would happen next. So I was the first man in the dressing room in Gory. It was in a Burn Cup final against Wexford. I was in the dressing room so early, I was about there half an hour before anybody else, only the groundsman and myself. I was tugged out. Uh, my boots, my socks, my shorts, uh, no top on. Um, the jerseys were given out. The subs jerseys were given out. And I got no jersey. And I asked the kit man, Are any jerseys left? And he said, no. And um, I had no jersey in my kit bag. I had no tracksuit top in my kit bag because I presumed I was playing. And uh, I had to go ask one of the other players for a tracksuit top. And um, again, you know, that was Sean letting me know that I stepped out of line. Um, uh, and we had those sort of experiences where uh, we were difficult with one another, you know. Um, and that day in Gorey, I sat on the sideline and he put me on with about 10 minutes to go. And I had to go and ask one of the other subs for their jersey. So um, <laughs> on the meet team in those days, like it was, you know, we were fairly tough on, 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 on each other. Um, we didn't take prisoners. Uh, and that was Sean being tough on me uh, and telling me that I wasn't living up to the expectations of the rest of the players. Uh, but it was pretty heavy duty stuff. Because I wonder, so, like, I come away from this thinking at times, did you love football? You know, you, you're writing fiction in more recent times. You're talking mm -hmm. there about finishing up football or in your head finishing up around 28. Or that's where your mindset was going. I'd imagine having your your kind of writing uh, about sports as your job, then going playing sports three or four times a week, you know, the same sport, that that would kind of test your patience after a while. So long story short, do you love football? I, I, I always, I always um, loved certain parts of the game. Um, I resented it a lot, a lot of the time, um, in that... I found the pressures and the strains of, of the game really hard. 
And that's probably why I didn't hit my, you know, 10 out of 10 all the time. I found it really hard, the pressures and strains, club football and county football. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, I'm not trying to be too dramatic about that, but I really would be self-analytical. Uh, I would be mortifyingly self-critical. And um, there were only small moments. Like I was lucky. I was very lucky in the end. We lost. We won nothing on the meat team for six years, and then we won nearly everything. We did win everything. And I was lucky. I was lucky that Sean Boylan came around. I was lucky to have all the players I was surrounded by. Um, so I look back at that, you know, very thankfully. But of the games themselves, there was only tiny portions of my uh, of my career, and only tiny portions of games that I could tell you I enjoyed. I want to hear players now saying that they love the game and they love playing the game, and I can't understand that. The game for me was high risk, all business, and um, in many ways, just stressful. Um, you know, so with all that going on in my brain, uh, and as I say, I would have probably mild OCD or whatever, but in those days, um, it was a lot to carry. And, and that's why I think I wanted to retire early. Um, I said I would retire at 30, and um, and I did. Um, spectacularly so. I was dropped from the team um, before we played Leash in the first round of the championship in 92. I... For the only time ever, I was a non-drinker. I went to a barbecue in Martin Brehany's house, a colleague of mine. I uh, went to a barbecue in his house the night before the game. I had six cans of Budweiser that I would never have had. Uh, I was a sub the next day. After 20 minutes, John McDermott got KO'd. I was brought on. And in the last minute of the game, I thumped a leash player out of pure frustration and got sent off. And... Um, I'd retired an hour later and Sean read about it the next day. So uh, in terms of departures, it was a fairly dramatic departure from the meat team. Did, did he read about it in one of your own columns? No, he read about it. Martin Brown, he wrote about it the following morning in the Irish press. I presume he didn't mention the six cans. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but it was, it was like, it was all wrong, you know. Uh, it was all wrong. My head was wrong. And... Um, I remember phoning Sean, actually, on the Wednesday be before the game, asking him, am I on the team or not? He said, you're not. Uh, and uh, I started to put down the phone on him. So uh, I knew my career was ending, and, um, and I was ready to go. I mean, if you go in that style that I've just recounted to you, then you're really, you're really looking to go, you know? Uh, you're not, you have no doubts about it. And, and I had no opportunity to come back, because three months later, I was playing a tournament game for my club screen, and uh, I broke my arm very badly in eight different places. Uh, it was a car crash sort of uh, break. Uh, they couldn't pin the arm because it was, there was too many breaks. They could only put screws and bolts in, uh, which are still in to this day. And so I was in plaster, out of, in and out of plaster for about, about 18 months. And I was left with an arm that's 30 degree uh, hook on it uh, because I was in and out of plaster so much that they couldn't, um, I couldn't do the physio necessary to straighten the arm. So there was no question of coming back with me. So even if I wasn't determined to end my career, that injury made sure that my, my me days were over. That must have been mentally taxing even, that injury. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was one of those crazy things. Um, I was down interviewing Michael Coleman, the Galway hurler down in Portumna. And it was a beautiful, beautiful blue sky day. And the interview ended quickly. And I was driving back home. And I wasn't going to play for screen in the tournament game. And I said, feck it, look at that blue sky. It was one of those days when I wanted to play football because I always wanted to play football. I mean, I loved the game, but I was stressed out at the game at the same time. So I put the foot down, made it to uh, the pitch on time. And I remember I was leaving the dressing room and Trevor Giles was playing one of his first games for screen. And I remember saying to Trevor, you be careful out here. These lads aren't going to be looking after themselves. They're going to try to hurt somebody. And uh, they were my last words to Trevor. And uh, half an hour later, I, I was being carted off to um, to Navan Hospital by uh, a local farmer, Jimmy Swan, who had me in the front of his Jeep. And my arm was broken, as I say, in eight places. And I was in the front of his Jeep. And we hit every pothole on the way into Navan. When we got to Navan, uh, I was lying on this gurney, and this nurse came to me and said, uh, I don't know how I'm going to get that jersey off you. And I said, 
Colin O'Rourke had just sponsored the team with a new set of beautiful blue jerseys with Colin O'Rourke Sports in the front of them. And I was looking at her thinking, I had to tell her, you're going to go get a scissors. You're going to cut this jersey off me. <laughs> and she went and got a scissors to cut the jersey up the middle. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, that, that was, that was how my career ended. That was my last, that was my, uh, that was the uh, ending. I, I ended with all guns blazing, if you like. And like in terms of like the Mead team would have had several reunions over the years, but you, you chose to never go to them. And I believe you even wrote a piece about why you weren't going to them. Yeah, I'm not, I don't do reunions well. Uh, I don't do any business reunions. I've never done a school reunion. Uh, I did one Mead football reunion in the last 30 years and it just didn't work for me. I mean, you know, I love the lads. I have great memories. They were heroes, so many heroes in my life. Uh, I'm still very friendly with two or three of them. But I did write at the end of my book, I did write at the end of my book on the last page that out of our skin that I'm going to leave this dressing room. Uh, I'm going to shut the door behind me. And I wasn't trying to be prophetic at all, but I did actually write that I'll be happy enough to leave most of the relationships in the room behind me. Um, I, I say I wasn't trying to be prophetic, but that's how it turned out because, you know, um, they were great people, great time. Uh, but for me, I'm the sort of person who wants to, I need to push myself forward all the time. I need to see what's happening next. And I don't necessarily want to hold on to relationships forever or to live with older relationships forever. Uh, it's just how my brain works. I don't mean that in a selfish way or anything. It's just how my brain works. I like to move on. It may come from my, uh, I don't know, I've never, I've never sat down and had any analysis or never sat down with a, you know, had any um, psychiatrist work on me. But, you know, when my brother died by suicide in 83, I know that had a profound effect on me, whether it's, you know, post-traumatic stress or whatever. I know that's had a role in my life, but I've never investigated it. But I do think part of my life has been to move. I know after the early years, after Jared died, I couldn't stand still. I always had to have something happening in the next three months or six months. I was terrified of of standing still or, or going back. And um, again, I'm not trying to get too dark on you here, but it did propel me. And because of that, through my career, through my business career, I've always been starting companies wanting to do something new. Uh, and that's just part of my nature. Whether it comes back down to that experience with Jared, um, I would guess if I sat down with uh, medical people that I'm pretty sure something of that nature would be identified. But I've never, I've never, uh, foolishly, I've never sat down. I think we should. I think people, and mental illness is something I take very seriously. Um, um, my brother died because of mental illness. And it's something that we should all be far more aware of and we should all take far greater care of ourselves. Thankfully, now people talk about it all the time and it's, it's out there. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't, you know, so I never saw any help. Uh, but looking back now, of course, I should have. How old were you actually when your brother passed? I was 21. I was, he went, the day before he died, he went and bought me my, my birthday presents. He bought me three books uh, for my 21st birthday. So... But his diaries showed that he was contemplating taking his own life for months. So it was nothing to do with my 21st birthday. So it was just, uh, it was just uh, a day, two days before my 21st, yeah. And of course, obviously, this all seems very trivial compared with that. But how, how would you feel you were regarded by your, your Meath teammates? Because, you know, and in light of the fact that you wouldn't have gone to the reunions. I think a lot of lads would sort of understand me now at this stage uh you know they're they're a good bunch you know we see each other i do see them at funerals and things like that um um they're a good bunch some of them understand me um some of them i don't see anymore uh i had some great friends in that team you know lads like finian murta who uh you know somebody i played with didn't didn't get on the meet teams and was all in the finals but was a massive massive friend massive colleague still will be a great friend i don't meet finian, finian that much I don't meet Mickey McQuillan that much. Um, I go for long walks on the beach with Bob O'Malley as regularly as we can. Um, we're very like-minded. Um, but uh, I talk to Jerry McEntee two or three times a year, maybe maybe more often. Um, but uh, Bob, myself and Jerry meet for a, a lunch every Christmas. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, not in a selfish way, I hope, but I'm, I'm sort of selective. I think the lads understand me at this stage. I think for a while they thought I was just odd. Uh, but at this stage, they know it, you know, I won't be there. And um, uh, and they're a great bunch. So, you know, uh, I think they understand me. 
Did you did the Cork the Cork team that you played against in some of those classic games? Did you understand each other for a finish? Like just two two teams full of dogs of war who wanted to get to the top. Yeah, I think we did. Like we went to war too quickly. I don't know what caused the animosity, but instantly we were at each other's throats, and um, I never fully understood that. But we've become really good friends since. It's amazing. It sounds like the old cliche. Uh, some of the court guys are. Are, are you know they're serious serious lads like great fellas um uh, larry being just one of them but there's lots of good lads like niall Cahal and lots of good lads i won't mention names and we understand each other and we appreciate each other now but why we went to war so fast and so violently uh, i never really understood at the time um, i think both teams really wanted to win we had you know we had looked at trying to beat dublin for 20 years they had looked at trying to beat Kerry for forever and I think when both of us got there, we said, this is a chance. This is a one in a million chance and we have to do it. Um, and I think that was really the reason. But I think both teams were desperate, you know. Because I, I often wonder the fact that Shea Fahey and Larry Tompkins were from Kildare and Kildare would, of course, be arrived with Mead. Did that add to it? Also, the fact that, you know, it'd be very easy to throw stones at them and say turncoats, this kind of stuff, uh, especially when they're from a rival county. Yeah, I mean, I think... For us, it personalised a little bit because we knew Shay. As I knew Shay and, and Larry really well. Um, but for us also, it increased. I think it increased our uh, our need to win. Uh, for us, we used it to our advantage. Definitely, um, they. Uh, you know, we saw them as being additions to a good Cork team. We knew it was going to be twice as hard for us to win. Like people, have, people nowadays may have no idea how good Larry Tompkins was. Um, Shea Fahey was a good midfielder. I, I won an all I won a man of the match against Shea in 87. He won a man of the match against me in, in, in 1990. So we, we both did a number on each other in, in two All-Ireland finals. Uh, but Larry was, I don't think people can, will ever know how good he was, the modern generation. I mean, he was, his book brings this out. Uh, his book will tell you how good he was. In his book, He'll explain how, you know, he spent time in England when he was recuperating from different injuries and he was up against the top footballers in England. Give an example, uh, Alan Shearer and himself spent two weeks in uh, rehab together. And Larry was off the charts. Like He whacked Alan Shearer, professional footballer, one of the real strong, physical, muscular full forwards in the game. It's on record. He, he destroyed Shearer in every single discipline. An amateur Gaelic footballer. Um, but Larry was mental. Larry was just absolutely determined to be the best footballer in the country. And when we were preparing for those games against Cork, uh, we would talk about Larry probably longer than we talked about the whole Cork team. Um, as I said to you, we would always personalise games. We would always pick out individuals. Um, with Cork, it was like 80% Larry Tompkins. And um, and uh, it, it was it was personal at that time. It was personal. Mm. And did you let's say before that nineteen ninety All Ireland Cork are looking for the double between hurling and football? Would you have written about him in your in your column? In the oh yeah, lead all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, Just mad um, when you think about it. Yeah, no, all the time, and and um, oh, it's a very dangerous. It was a very dangerous. Uh, you know, it was a very dangerous line to be walking for me. Uh, Sean Boylan was great. Like he never asked me any questions. He never asked to see anything I ever wrote in advance. He never criticized anything I ever wrote. I mean, he was exceptional uh, in allowing me to do my job. But there's no doubt I made life hard for the team because I had to talk about the core players. You know, I had to talk about us. And that was hard. And I think that's also what really, um, made me more determined to end my career because it, it wasn't enjoyable. I mean, it's not what you want to do. Preparing for a big match, the Leinster final against Dublin or an All-Ireland final, uh, the last thing you want to be doing is sitting down, uh, you know, in front of a typewriter in those days and spending three or four hours writing about the game. Uh, that's the last thing you want to be doing. And uh, so, you know, but I had to do it. It was my job. And, um, but it had a debilitating effect on me. There's no doubt about it. it I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. 
was like any time I've interviewed Sean Boylan, he's just this unbelievably friendly, sort of genial guy. Did he have a, a cut in him too when you were inside the four walls of the dressing room? Uh, Sean was hard. I mean, Sean, Sean was, you know, Sean was tough taskmaster. You know, he wouldn't take prisoners, and uh, um, it, it's, you know, the team wasn't created into the team; it became by accident. You know, Sean had a role in that, but he would also allow the team to to think for itself. Um, and as I say, we had four. We were very lucky that we had four older players who were like, even though I was the captain, say in '91 or whoever. There was four, old, four older players who really managed the team in the dressing room and on the field. And that was, you know, Mick Lyons, Conor O'Rourke, Jerry McEntee and Joe Castles. Uh, so when you look at teams now, for instance, look at Mayo, or you look at, or I look at teams like Mayo, or any team that's trying to make the breakthrough, even the Kerry team now, who are exceptional, the talent in that team is just off the charts, okay? But I look at them and I say, okay, how many geniuses do Mayo have in the full forward line? Maybe half, maybe half, maybe half a genius amongst three players, amongst six players. Look at the Kerry, they have geniuses, okay? They've got geniuses, Sean O'Shea, clever, 100% geniuses. But then you look at the team leaders, real team leaders. Mayo, they have three or four good team leaders. Um, Kerry, have they? I don't see them there at the moment. So when people say Kerry are gonna naturally take over from Dublin, they may or may not do that. The reason, the only reason I think they may not do that is I do not identify, I don't see four or five players who in games, in the toughest times, will grab everybody else by the scruff of the neck and carry them through. I don't see those players in the Kerry team at the moment. Uh, I've been hard on Kerry again. They have all the talent. Uh, uh, I don't see those players. That's the only question mark about the Kerry. So Mayo don't have the geniuses. Kerry don't have the leaders, and Dublin have both. It's not a very fair world. It sure isn't. Well, what about um, the influence of a couple of the players that you played with? So, Colm O'Rourke, of course, your, your club mate also at screen, Jerry McEntee, and like I believe that he took himself off the panel because you know he, he'd have to go over to America to the Mayo Clinic, yeah. you know, becoming a doctor, this kind of stuff, and then he'd be uh, parachuted back in. I believe he had a coming together with Pat Reynolds at one stage, which you might remember. Yeah, I mean, Jerry, Jerry was... Like Jerry McEntee is probably the most determined man I've ever seen in my life, football or off the field. And, and Jerry was, talk about my career, like Jerry was one of the most talented physicians, surgeons in the country. He was finessing his craft in England and in the Mayo Clinic in the US. Uh, he was being advised by his bosses in some of the greatest hospitals in the world, not to take chances, not to risk anything. His hands were his livelihood. His hands were worth millions, right? And, but he was still determined to come home and to win his place back in the team. And, but it was just an off the wall determination. I say to Jerry, and I'll say it to you straight up, uh, and I've said this to Jerry many times because we're very, very close. Like Jerry was born with lesser ability than me in every category. Like, I could run faster, uh, I could score more, I could catch 10 balls out of the air over Jerry's head out of 10. And when we played against each other, I very often did that, right? Uh, he just wasn't as good as me in any single category, right? Transfer us to the me team, and I've told you I would play 10 out of 10 every two games out of 10. Jerry would play 11 out of 10, 10 games out of 10. So I have no idea how a person like that can bring that much to the game and deliver of themselves every single thing they have every single day. It mystified me. Um, if I had what he had, I probably would have won 20 All-Stars. Uh, I probably would have because I always feel that my ability and his determination would have been a great partnership. I played with him midfield for like 10 years and, um, and uh, you know, I won a lot of games uh, for me, but Jerry was constant in terms of carrying the team, constant. Did it's he? incredible. It's, it's very hard for people, again, to people to appreciate because uh, 
he wasn't a naturally gifted footballer, uh, but he had every other quality. Did he leave a dent in Pat Reynolds' car at one stage? Oh, he did. Sorry, you asked me that. Yeah, one occasion he wasn't picked and he shouldn't have been picked. Um, because Jerry was away and I was trying to, I was trying to take charge of the team in the middle of the field because Jerry was away because it was like, it was, it was supposed to evolve and I was, life was going to go on without Jerry. And I had a, there was a young midfielder called Colin Brady, came on the team for a few years with an exceptional talent. I wanted Colin to be on the team. Um, it was his turn. It was my turn to be the senior midfielder. It was Colin's turn to, to come under my wing and to carry me forward. And Jerry kept coming back from abroad and breaking down doors and wanting to get back on the team. And on one occasion, he was a sub. And when the team was announced, he walked straight into the car park and started kicking Pat Reynolds' car and leaving dents in the door. And uh, we all understood that. Uh, you know, I think Pat and a couple of deflectors and Sean followed Jerry out saw what he was doing, uh, watched him, and then saw him get into his own car and speed out of the ground. But again, different times, um, uh, different times. And But again, you know, it's a snapshot of who, who Jerry was as a man. And just, um, just wondering, is there anything else that kind of, just before I move on from that team, anything else that marks out, that is kind of stands out from that particular team and that particular era that made you, made you what you were? Uh, I don't know. Um, we like you look back at football then, and if you see any, I don't look. I, as I say I don't look back. I don't look at old games. Anytime I'm unfortunate enough to come across an old game, which I have once or twice on TV, uh, I've watched it. Um, I would always be self-critical of myself if I watched it for ten or fifteen minutes. But I've always been critical too of the nature of the game. It was madcap catch and kick. It was a, it was mayhem on the field. And I think the game has evolved now into a smarter game. It's trying at times, uh, and it's going to stay like that. It's developing into a smarter game. I love the modern game. Um, I, I, I really think it's great. Um, but in our day, you know, the, on the meat team, uh, we were the, the defining thing for us was Sean Boyle. And again, it's a cliche. Um, you know, if you're lucky enough to, to have someone walk amongst you who is magical as a person, um, who potentially has magic in the herbal bottles that he, ha that he has in his car, uh, and you believe in that person, uh, then you can do anything. Uh, and Sean Boylan believed that we could, made us believe that we could do anything. Like, don't forget, in my first three years in the meet team, we lost to, to um, Wexford in the first round of the championship in 1981. We were lost to Longford in the first round of the championship in 82. We lost to Dublin in the first round of the championship in 83. So I was into my fourth year on, Mead on the Mead team and I'd never won a championship game. Within two years, uh, we were taken off and we were about to be the, you know, the dominant team in the country. So that's how quickly he turned it. Then, like, would you have tried to bring any of that into your two years with Carlo? I think it was 05, 06 that you took over that team. And your, your dad is a Carlo man, if, I, if I'm correct. Yeah, my dad, Jim, played with Carlo for 10 years. Uh, played with, um, he was a Palatine man, and uh, he was a full forward. Um, the biggest day in his career was playing in the 54 league final against Mayo. Um, so Carlo was always very close, you know, very special to me. It's where I was born. It's where I was raised. Could have been a Carlo man, could have played for Carlo and won nothing. Always very conscious of that. Um, my grandfather, Liam Hayes, is buried in the cemetery on the way into Carlo town. He used to stop by his grave very often and and um, uh, and look at his name um, and think that, yeah, I could have lived my life in Carlo. So we moved to Dublin. Um, my dad bought a site in Castle Knock and we were going to live there. He started building a house. And again, for some reason, decided not to, and we travelled to Mead and moved to Mead, where my mother was from, Margaret Smith. Um, so it could have been in Carlo, it could have been in Dublin, ended up being a Mead footballer. Um, but Carlo was always very important to me. And they had no manager back in 05, uh, and I volunteered to help them out for two years, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, but what I did learn, Shane, was that, well, I learned two things, that there aren't enough hours in the week for a manager. Um, that's the first thing I learned. I was averaging about 30 hours a week in Carlo uh, to make a real difference 
I would have had to be down there 60 hours a week. Um, I really would. And the second thing I learned is that any county that really wants to pull up its own socks needs a, a native manager because you know so much more. Like my biggest problem in Carlo was I love working with the players and I had a brilliant bunch of players and they were so talented. Like I used to tell people in Mead how talented the Carlo players were and they would be disbelieving. The talent was off. It was unbelievable. Um, but it was all misdirected. So I think back to Sean Boylan. When Sean Boylan was changing us, he lived amongst us, right? He was with us 24-7. I don't mean just in the dressing room. Sean would be in our houses. If there was a party in my house when I was living in Screen and Mead. Sean would arrive in. Sean, you know, Sean would be with you all the time. Uh, he lived with you. Um, and when I was with Carlo, I tried to do many of the things I learned from Sean and I had some success. We won a few championship matches, but I always felt that every time I drove, left Carlo and drove back up to Dublin, because I live in Dublin the last 30 years, that the players, my players are going to meet somebody on the street who's going to undo what I've done. They're going to meet somebody in their own home who's going to undo what I've done. They're going to meet somebody in their club who's going to undo what I've done or tell them why believe Hayes. So every time I was outside of the county, uh, I felt I was at a disadvantage and I felt my work was probably being undone. Not mischievously, it was just being undone naturally by somebody. Um, is, is that OCD and, at and That's play? where you need to be living with your players, you need to be amongst them. Is, is that OCD at play? No, but you just need to, like, if you're going to change someone's mindset, you can't do it like for two hours or three hours, uh, four or five times a week. They have to buy into you. You've got to buy into them and you've got to live each other's lives. You know, I mean, I have no doubt whether they like him or whether they dislike him. Um, that the Dublin players lived Jim Gavin's life's life and principles and vice versa. But that's how great teams are created. Um, you know, and you don't have to love a manager to, you know, to live his life. You don't have to love him. Like many people have spoken to, we're, we're publishing a lot of books in England at the moment, as I mentioned to you. And, and I found out in England, in, in English sport and in Irish sport, and Mike Ross, whose book we published two years ago, uh, said it brilliantly uh, about Joe Schmidt, you know, the most successful Irish rugby coach of recent times. He said, it's like every team, one third of the players love him, one third dislike him, and one third are putting up with him. Um, and that's Joe Schmidt, who was changing people's lives, making that Irish rugby team into the greatest Irish rugby team of all time, even despite what happened in Japan. They, they, you know, they rank as the number one team. Uh, but 66% of those people didn't necessarily love Joe Schmidt, but they understood what he wanted them to do, and they lived his life. They lived the life that he asked them to live. Did and if that doesn't happen in GA teams, you've got no chance. You know what I mean? You've got no chance. And that's why 90% 90, 90 of teams in Gaelic football especially are non-competitive, because that doesn't exist. Was that was it during that Carlo period that uh, you had that, there was that strange interaction where something was said to a referee from the north and yeah. uh, you were accused. Can you sort of give the background to that? Yeah, it was strange. I, we played Longford in a National League game. Uh, down in uh, Longford and in Pierce Park. And the other thing I found out when I was Carla manager is that I was a lunatic on the sideline. I was a danger to myself and to uh, everybody. Um, I needed to be up in the stand and I tried to get up to the stand as much as possible because I just, I, I, um, I couldn't cope with referees very much. I took everything personally. But I got better at it. I felt we were hard done by in Longford. Um, and I marched onto the field surrounded by a lot of people a lot of people marched after me and words were said to the referee who reported them to the CCCC that I had told him that there weren't half enough of them shot up north um, which is not a good thing to say uh, to anybody um, as it happened I didn't say those words um, it so happens I know who did say them um, but the referee um, wrote up his report and said that I had said that to him. So I had to go to uh, a CCC meeting uh, and tell them that I didn't say it, um, that it wouldn't be in my nature to say it. 
Um, I don't know why they believe me, because I don't think I got a suspension. But I remember walking in to the meeting and being amazed at the number of people around the table. It must have been about 20 of them. I saw plates of sandwiches to one side that they were obviously going to eat. And then luckily before I sat down, I saw Bob, uh, Bob Honan of Cork in the top left hand corner who gave me a wink. And Bob and I had always got on for some reason, but he just gave me a wink. And um, I felt he was going to take care of me <laughs> at that meeting. And I think he did. So it was a Cork man who saw me through. Um, but yeah, I wasn't good on the sideline. The other thing I wasn't good at, Shane, was even though I had been a reporter and analysed games and written about games for so long, I found out on the sideline, on the Carlos sideline, if plan A didn't work after 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I had no idea what plan B was going to be. I found it very hard to read the game. I found it very hard to make the right decisions. Uh, and um, I discovered very quickly how difficult it is to be, uh, to be a good manager and to be a county manager and how impossible it is to, be, to do so on the sideline. Um, Jim Gavin would sit on the sideline in his day, but all the work, all the meticulous work was done far in advance. There was very little he was going to have to do to change things, but on the occasional sub. But uh, when you're Carla manager, things are going to go wrong in every game. Things are going to go wrong fast in every game. And you have to have a plan B, C and D. I found in one game, I made the cardinal rule. I broke the cardinal rule that no manager should ever do. I remember in one game, things were going wrong. And I looked around and, start, and stared at my subs bench. Uh, I was transfixed. And I must have looked at them for about 20 seconds. It seemed like about 20 minutes. And I just looked at them. And I had no idea. And I turned around. <laughs> And I know they, they saw me looking at them. And if everybody, because I'm asked sometimes now, what's the one thing you learned as a manager at Carlo? Uh, I've written it a few times. Never turn around and look at your subs. Um, never do that. If you, if you don't know what you're going to do next and you've got to look at your subs bench, you're in a bad, bad place. Mm. We, we started off talking about books. and I'll probably finish up with that too. So a final question. On your book, Heidi Wells, rather than having Liam Hayes, you have William Hayes on it. Um, is there any particular reason for that? Yeah, it's just early stages. William is sort of a literary name. You know, so many great authors with the word William. I also have written so many books uh, by Liam Hayes that I don't want people to career down a wrong road. Somebody in America or Japan or God knows where. Um, if I am successful as a fiction writer and find this all these other books that I've written. I've written about 15 or 20 autobiography uh, biographies of people, um, including Ken Venturi and Rory McIlroy, uh, Kevin Heffernan, I've written a lot of books. But uh, I wanted my fiction, works, work of fiction to be identifiable. Uh, that's a moving feast. Um, when Heidi Wells is reissued and when Avery Truffle, the story of Avery Truffle is, is completed, uh, it'll probably be... Um, LP Hayes or something like that. Um, I just want to put something on that's not identifiable, basically. Yeah. Do you ever go stone mad when you're sitting there trying to come up with the next sentence or the next theme or whatever it might be? In a work of fiction, never. Uh, anything I've ever written uh, on Irish sport, I get demented. Um, I take it so seriously and I worry about what I write um, that I sometimes, um, I find that very hard. I find writing fiction much easier. I find it um, more enjoyable, more freedom, more, much more freedom, really liberating. And also, when you've got great characters, they, they bring you, they look after you. Great characters, if you build two or three great characters, and I did build two or three great characters in Heidi, um, in Heidi Wells, and there's two or three great characters in that book. Um, and they look out, they, they, they determine um, pretty much Oh, before you get a halfway through a book, uh, they determine really where you're going to bring them next. Uh, and that's great. Liam, you've been very good at your time and uh, best of luck with all the books that you're, you're publishing and I uh, wish you every future success. Thank you, Shane. It's been a pleasure to chat with you and uh, no, thank you for everything.